and it, uh, this amazing program, and it was amazing because we got together, and um, we started working on a project together in a class that was a record production class, and Mark was a producer in the class, and I was a aspiring recording artist, and the teacher who was a great guy, um, Mike McCulka, he actually has a place in Austin now, a recording studio, but he, um, he paired us up to do a project together. He was pairing the whole class up. The, the class was a bunch of producers and a bunch of musicians, and he'd say, okay, who wants to do this, who wants to do that, and then we just hooked up that way. Had you done any studio stuff before? I had done some recording on a, on a cassette four track a lot with, with friends and goofing around with that myself, yeah. So this was the first time you'd been in a, like a real sort of studio environment? Yeah, a lot more tracks than four, so that was fun. <laughs> and what about you? Did you have a did you have a, an earlier career in in aside from aspiring? Mm -hmm. but what were you doing before you started the class musically? Nothing. It was in my mind. Um, I always knew one day I would be singing in a band and writing my own music, but. Um, it wasn't really until I moved from New Orleans and took a leap of faith and um, I was a little bit crazy but in a kind of a messed up relationship it got me to California and um, after a little stint in corporate America I found out about Long Beach City College and I just took a class purely for fun and um, it was a the right step in the right direction to get me to that thing that was always going on in my head. Like one day you're gonna get out and have a band, sing and play. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't gonna play. I was always gonna be there, be the singer. And now I get to I do made a little her, bit of both. I made her play the bass. <laughs> <laughs> well, that worked out really well. You're you're great at it. <laughs> Thank you. I really love playing it, and uh, that was not in the plan. But I really, it's really fun to do. So. So you weren't singing in church, or you weren't like singing in the in the shower. I mean, what were you were you singing at all? I mean, before you came out here, hmm. at all? I was the only person who ever heard me sing was my little sister. That was the only person I didn't mind expressing myself. And my four walls of my room, and when when the family wasn't home, I would sing along with records, vinyl. <laughs> But um, never ever got out and did anything. I was very shy. I was overweight. I was um, 50 pounds heavier than I am now, and I was just wasn't ready to do it. And <laughs> how did you get started writing? Hmm. <laughs> I started writing. I think that's something I might have dabbled with, you know, as a teenager. Might have tried to write something that just didn't get very far, but um, hmm. I started writing because I hooked up with a guitar player in corporate America and had the opportunity to do something. And he was playing pretty much like blues rock, some pretty basic changes. It was very e easy to write to in a way. Mm -hmm. So um, my say long road from New Orleans to the West Coast came out in song. So it was that you know kind of. He done me wrong, sort of stuff, or fantasy love songs. So that's how it started. So I don't know. Just listening to a lot of good songwriters, I think, helped. Mark, now what about you? Uh, you, <laughs> you you mentioned before that that you got pretty pretty early start with a guitar, but were you were you just playing covers? And when did you start to write yourself? I started out playing folk songs. My dad had a guitar around the house and I picked it up and goofed around with it and he showed me a few chords. And for a while I was just doing that, just writing, just singing songs, little, little folk songs. <laughs> then I got involved in a band at Jefferson Junior High School, which was much later on in life. I, I, I was playing guitar in, in the house when I was six, seven years old, eight years That's old. Real young. I wasn't really playing it, I was goofing around making <laughs> sounds, but it started the process of me loving the guitar. Right. I got a, I, I was I was in and out of the 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 guitar a lot and I went into um, Jefferson Junior High School here in Long Beach. 
And I, I met some friends and we started goofing around with the guitars and we were, we were playing around. And then I went to, I also did some time at uh, Franklin Junior High School. In Franklin Junior High School, they actually had a rock band class. It was, it was an amazing thing. Mm. We had keyboards, we had a horn section, we had, we had a couple of singers, mm. we had a drummer, a bass player, and I was one of the guitar players. Me along with the teacher. The teacher was the other guitar player. So that, we, would, we would play school functions. We would go on tour to other schools and play for, the, for those schools or to a fair. I remember we did a fair of some, of some sort. Mm. Wow, that's 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 amazing. Yeah. Uh, 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 so, did you were you writing at that point, or were you pretty much? I mean, when did you get the bug to actually put pen to paper? I know that at some point you started doing that. I started writing later on in life. I I kind of again was falling in and out of the guitar uh, in, in my twenties, doing other things. I think I started writing my own stuff much later. Although I was, I was, I got into a band where the, where the guy was writing his own songs, and I was really digging it. That we were like doing our own thing, and it was really fun. And that's where I caught the bug of doing originals and not covers. Mm-hmm. They played at Bogarts mm-hmm. the week that Nirvana played there. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't go to either show. I was not cool enough at that time. <laughs> Were you even here yet? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was somewhere in the... When when did Nirvana start? When was that? It was in early, the early 90s? 90s, yeah, early 90s. Wow. Early 90s before we met. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm. so you guys seemed like primed to collaborate. And when you first started working together, how did that go? I think Sharon, well, it was in the production class, and Sharon had a song, and, and she was looking for a riff or some beats and, and some chord changes, and I, I, I brought some chord changes, and I had a drum machine that I knew real well, and I, and I programmed a whole song in this drum machine, and we put the song together that way. He had and all the right tools. That of anything, I had a cassette player, but he had a four-track cassette. And he had a bunch of guitars and stuff, mm-hmm. and a drum machine, which I probably never even touched a drum machine. But actually, it was with that corporate America guy, guitar player. We had this song. It had this good energy, but it was just like I think I had that a recording of a guitar. And then the more we got into it, it was like, wow, let's make program some drums. So he made this. He fine crafted, marked it, every little nuance of a drum kit, like every bar. He created like these drum beats, and he would actually tweak the pitch of like the snare and do all this. I mean, and we had this uh, killer drum track, and then he lays this bass down on it, and then you know guitar, and it's like, oh my gosh! So it really pushed me. You know, the production helped the growth of the song, helped the way I expressed myself in the song. Then I was able to take that track to the school and do a vocal on two-inch tape, which was amazing. So we did, you know cassette tape, band stuff, instrumental, and then I got to do this amazing vocal, and it was like, I was in heaven. I was in a real studio. I mean, th- that school had an amazing studio, or well, more than one, but singing in an amazing, what was it, a 414 microphone. I didn't know I could sound that good. And then under headphones, 414, two-inch tape, a real producer. The, the teacher was this amazing producer who took it to another level. I was in heaven. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> so then you guys, after that, when, what was the impetus for deciding, okay, we are going to start a band? I think we didn't start a band right then and there. We were going out doing acoustic shows. I played acoustic guitar and Sharon sang. And we were writing songs on an acoustic guitar for a, for, for a good while. And then, then we produced finally, them with drums. Yeah, then we, yeah we did some produce, produ- production with drums. And then it was, I got an electric guitar, and that changed the game. So let's let's not get ahead of ourselves here. So <laughs> so that little that little duo, Sharon and Mark. Mm. It was, had a really good name. Was known as S and M. Oh, 
<laughs> that offended a lot of people. I didn't get it. <laughs> but it was so cute. It was just appropriate. Sharon and Mark. Sharon and Mark. Yes. Yeah. Nothing um, weird about that. Actually, that duo ties in with um, the show we're do doing, obviously, in two nights. Um, because from going to that school, we met an amazing engineer who was also getting his chops together at the school for recording. And he would record us at Sunset Sound recording. So we actually got to do these things that we did with acoustic guitar and drum machine. We actually got to go into Sunset Sound and track some of that stuff on two inch. So before we had a live drummer. <laughs> so let's back up. Who is this person? Chris Kane. Mm -hmm. Chris Kane. Yeah, he's local. Long Beacher. And Sunset Still Sound, delighted. for those who don't know. Sunset Sound is a well known uh, recording studio that's had a lot of great rock and roll bands go through it and record great The albums. Doors. Prince was there, <laughs> Van Halen was there. Yeah, pretty much every, <laughs> every, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> they everybody. Would we would we would go in mm. on the off hours. We would go in at twelve o'clock at night and get out of there at six or seven in the morning sometimes. I thought the off hours would be like seven AM to like noon. One Interesting. Would, one would think, yeah. uh, <laughs> but it wasn't. Yeah, it was actually night. Yeah, some people actually work during working hours there. Um, Beck had one of the studios locked out. And then we were like in studio one, actually we tracked in one, two, and three. And it was magic. And we had no band. We had some songs. And I guess we just, we tracked drum machine tracks. We just transferred them over. But then um, Mark did basically all of the guitar stuff on top of that. And I did some amazing vocal stuff in these million dollar vocal booths. And I remember hearing like even um, like a plate reverb that you could access, you know, from the control room. It's like, oh, you know, let's put that up on plate number, blah, blah, blah. And sure enough, there's these big areas like in basically look like attics, like in an attic of the room. And I could hear, you know, these vocals. I mean, it was, it was magic. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, what happened at that point then? What was the, what was the next step for you guys after that? Getting a drummer. Getting a drummer. That was, that was a real thing. It was, I was tired of the drum machine. I was tired of programming it. And I wanted to take these songs out and really do them right. And actually, I wasn't in my little band, if you want to call it a little band, with, cor with a corporate America person. And Mark wasn't in that original band that he was in. We kind of decided to use the synergy between us and do our own thing. And plus, it was a lot easier because those other people were not available as much as we were. We were really, really committed to it and going through the program there and wanted to do it more. <laughs> so how did you find your drummer? Mm -hmm. He was a student at Long Beach City College in the music program. Ta -da. <laughs> His name is Damien Smith and he, he is a phenomenal all-around musician. He's mm -hmm. one of the best musicians I know that's, that's in Long Beach. He plays with all, all, just about everybody uh, that's doing something and teaches music too. And we, it, you know, it was, was S&M with Sharon and I, and then when Damien came along, well, it was natural that we would call the band Threesome. He was really cute. So, <laughs> so it went from S&M to Threesome. Who would have known? Yeah. Shay Gower of Open Books mm -hmm. drummed with us before Damien, and Mark was playing his acoustic guitar, like, through... A PA speaker or something? Remember? And it was like Shay, you know, formerly of Open Books. Yeah. He was our drummer for a while. And then somehow we had this energy going with this little trio for a little while. And Mark was just like wanting to you want to add some more energy, right? You know, I'm answering the question. You are answering the question. <laughs> I think that was my Let's question. Let's leave <laughs> okay, now for the background vocal on that answer. <laughs> We were we were doing stuff Flashback. and and I, I felt I felt the a desire to hmm. I felt the desire to move away from the drum machine, find a drummer, and I wanted to explore the electric guitar more. Because I just felt there was some energy there that I wanted to capture. And and uh, how did you how did you guys connect with Shay? I'm just I have to ask. So. 
He was at Long, Long Beach, Beach City, City College. College. Nice. She, she, was a, she was a recording student also at Long mm -hmm. Beach City College. It was an amazing program. There mm -hmm. were so many eager people that just were musicians that were there because they loved what they were doing. They were all super artistic. Everybody was sharing everything. It was a great community and a great vibe just to meet other musicians and to get something happening. Tell me about the sort of the evolution of Threesome. The evolution was <laughs> was a phenomenal experience because I I, I gained so much uh, of myself in music through that band because it, it I was able to explore my guitar sounds with a drummer with the, with the singer and you were playing bass then you, she, she picked up the bass in threesome and we were just we were just writing songs and it was uh, a great experience to go through and the evolution took us through writing songs and then performing the songs and getting an idea of what it's like to be on stage mm -hmm. and performing songs and doing it more and more and getting more and more comfortable on a stage. So that whole process was, was going on. And then we went on tour with Threesome, which was another great experience. So I, we, mm -hmm. we just gained so much stuff about being in a, in a band from Threesome. Because we just did everything a band was supposed to do. So we just did it and we just you know, through all the, all, all the stuff came out the other end and, and it was just great. So tell me about the tour. I have to ask you about the tour. Tell me about the tour. Where did you guys go? How did that happen? How did it go? Well, Damien, mm -hmm. Damien at the time was in another band also called Triptych and he, he was the guitar player. Well, we all wanted to go on, go on tour. Triptych, and, and it was going to be both bands. Two trios. Two trios, yeah. So, we, Sharon is from New Orleans. She has family in New Orleans. So we thought, well, what a great end point to go to. Let's, let's drive to New Orleans. And sure enough, that's what we did. We drove to New Orleans and we set up gigs along the way. We, we bunny hopped gigs out to New Orleans. We did, a, we did a couple of shows in New Orleans and then we bunny hopped some gigs on the way back. Just a straight line down the tent and, and yeah. then back. But we did go up to Austin. Right, so in Tempe was our first stop. Yeah. And what? our RV broke down. We rented an RV, and we drove out on a little evening. And by late that night, I don't know, ten o'clock or something, we had a fuse go out on the RV or something. Cars were like honking their horns, saying something was wrong with it. It's like I think they couldn't see us. Like lights oh, were out and all this, geez. so we were stranded in Riverside the first night, but got to Tempe on time for our. Isn't that a song, "Stranded in Riverside"? <laughs> Probably so. so old. But we didn't do that. <laughs> We played the Tempe and, um, of course, El Paso. We did two shows in El Paso at the same place, coming, going, and coming back, which was fantastic. It was a pizza place, and it was actually the best, one of the best shows we did. Like, people actually came back for the second show because they knew we were going to be swimming back like a week later or whatever. Oh, that's which awesome. Was really fun. Um, Austin, and then we did two shows in Austin, like, one at some dinner place that had a stage, of course, because it was Austin, and one was on 6th Street, this huge place where we played under a tent outside in the pouring rain. We were totally dry. The stage was bigger than those stages that are outside in Long Beach ever. I mean, it was amazing, and, but it was on an odd night of the week. And it was sort, so, of, it was sort, of, <laughs> the af, it was sort of the aftermath of South by Southwest. Oh. So it was kind of, yeah. It was the aftermath. We were there like a week after or something. So. Everyone was all like... <clears throat> mm. There wasn't a whole lot of people, but it had that vibe going on. Mm -hmm. So we did play Rock and Bowl in New Orleans, where my family and friends are. And that was really good. Tell me about Rock and like Bowl. A, a nice big crowd. Rock and Bowl is a bowling alley <laughs> in New Orleans where... I mean, the best thing is in the heyday of that time, at least so this was like um, about 10 years ago, and it's still going on, there was a bowling alley, big bowling alley, many lanes, classic, old building upstairs in this old building, and on each side of the place, big stage. So like bands over here, when that band's done, the other band starts on the other side. Just any night of the week. Amazing music. Rock, jazz, blues. 
We did an open mic there once with my dad sitting in on the saxophone and my sister, I think, played with us. We just brought guitars, basses, there was a house drummer. My dad played stuff. We, we put some songs together. But the open mic was like a concert. It was huge. I mean, there were probably 200 people there at least, just standing room, watching an open mic that was fully amplified with a house band. You could use the band or not. I mean, that was kind of amazing. Wow. So that's the place where we went with our two bands and did a show there. And it was great because my family promoted it really well. So it's, it was a nice benefit when you play where your family is. <laughs> that's great. Did, yeah. did the, the music scene in New Orleans uh, have any kind of like impact on you as, a, as an artist? It definitely did because I grew up in a family of musicians even though I spent the beginning of my life in the closet about me being a musician or a singer. Um, I really did, but the scene, I mean, my dad still plays gigs down there and whenever we go back, we go to his shows, he comes to ours when he's out here. Um, but I saw a lot of live shows growing up, just thinking about this now. That affected me, like big um, supper dance shows that my dad played at like the Fairmont Hotel or the Roosevelt Hotel, Hotel so really nice clubs where people probably paid $50 for caviar before the show <laughs> and see these like I know my dad played with um like Bette Midler even went through this club when Barry Manilow was her piano player like a lot of history there so I saw people of that caliber like ringside at the musicians wives table but I was like the little kid who went to the shows so I saw a lot of diverse music but most of it was probably like bigger band sounds not necessarily the hot you know the New Orleans grew but of course Mardi Gras I mean that, that music's going on everywhere so it affected me I mean that's probably part of the slush of slush box because <laughs> New Orleans that rhythm in that music Dr. John all that there's a inherent slush in all of that that's what kind of makes it, you feel the sweat in it, you feel the, the swamp. Right, right. So, wh what was the transition between Threesome and Slushbox? How did that go? I think with Threesome we were, we were starting to get a little bit, I, w I wouldn't say burned out, but we, we were start, I think for me I was starting to question what we were doing and I wasn't sure if we were doing, if I was doing something that was that was catching on. I wanted to do. I wanted to do more with music. I wanted more people to be at my shows. I wanted all that stuff that anybody playing guitar at Long Beach wants. <laughs> you know, I, you want to do big. I wanted to do big shows, and I, I wasn't sure if Threesome was was doing it. And we just sort of let three let Threesome go go to the side, and we started rewriting some stuff, and then we found Terry. And we put together some songs that were a little more poppy, a little, a little more lighter than Threesome. And we were just t trying to try another avenue in music, exploring something different, just doing a change for because we, we could. Right. <laughs> and that's what sort of happened with that. And so how's that worked out? I think it's worked out great. I mean, three. I, I love Slushbox and Threesome was a great band, and we're all we're almost sort of, we, you know, we started out with Threesome as kind of a little kind of heavy, heavy very 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 heavy, a <laughs> little bit of angst, heavy, heavy rock, or a lot. and then we went to Slushbox, and the mm -hmm. first album was very poppy and kind of happy, <laughs> and now we're sort of swinging, it. and now we're sort of swinging it back a little bit. So we're, we're trying to. I think we're finding a, a medium point be between the two bands. So, one of the other things that I, I, I wanted to talk to you about for ages now is um, mm. you went to UCLA, right? I did. Sort of in between Threesome and Slush Point. No. Um, not in between, concurrently. Actually, I, the best feeling of my life was being at UCLA, and it was like 2003, and um, getting ready for the summer break. And you know what? It, what it, you know what I could say as well. If people ask me what I was doing this summer, I'm going on tour. You know, to New Orleans. I mean, that was the most incredible dream. You know, come come true to be able to do that. 
But so. But you also went on a tour that was through the school as I, well. Yes, I did. I've been to Bulgaria twice playing the bass guitar, so, which has been that really. <laughs> tell me about added that. Added to the soup of life. That because that to me just blows my mind. So tell me, tell me how that happened. It blows mine too. <laughs> um, because of Long Beach City College, I transferred to UCLA. That's all I can say. I mean, Long Beach City College just just helped me thrive and find myself musically and in every way. And um, serendipitously, I filled out an application for the UCs and the Cal State system. Just on a whim, someone said, "Oh, the." the apps are due tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. You should fill out one. I'm like, okay, I'll take one. And okay, I'll take one for UC2, whatever. Did those in about 24 hours. And I wound up getting, um, Cal State wanted me to send an application fee. They, they sent it sent it back saying, send your fee. And UCLA sent me a letter to come audition on a certain day. So that was just pretty wild. But um, from being there at UCLA, I was in the ethnomusicology department. Purely because the night that I did the application, the major sounded good to me. I mean, that's how serendipitously, I'm just like, well, I don't really, I really don't want to sing opera. I'm not going to do classical vocal. Ethnomusicology, that sounds like a good branch of music. I'm going for it. And I did. And thank goodness I did. So um, in, that, in that program, there are different bands from all over the world and teachers from all over the world. And most of them, I really was not going to, I really didn't play the instruments in those bands. There was, so orchestras where, you know, I tried to do the oud and be in a Near East ensemble. That, just holding the little plectum to do the strings and the teacher said, oh, it's four strings like the bass. It's another instrument. I have so much respect for it. I did play the rick in that band. So there's me on a little tambourine with jingles. I, I could handle that. And did some good shows with that. But, um. Someone knew that I played the electric bass and told me there's a Bulgarian band that needs a bass player. And I'm like, that was really left field, you know, to me. I'm like, maybe an African band or a blues band or something, but what are you talking about? A, a Bulgarian band, what, what kind of music is that? And he said, oh, it's kind of like electric folk music. Really? I go, you know, I don't know anything about Bulgaria. It just, I'll, I'll check it out. And um, I did go there with my bass, and it was horrendous because I could barely read music. And everyone there had been in the group for a little while already, and they throw this bass chart in front of me. I had not really read bass clef on the bass because I'm self-taught through the S and M threesome program. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I had to learn how to read bass. I, mean, I knew I knew the notes. I'm like, hey, all cows eat grass. You know, I mean, that's really where I was at the time. Of course I was taking some music classes too, but I had to learn that under pressure. And the rhythms, you know, I thought I was getting good because the theory classes I was taking, okay, I, I can master rhythm, but I'm looking at like 7-8 or 15-8 or 11-8, and I was really trying to count it theoretically and like, you know, and the teacher would just tell me, it's like, mm, 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 mm. and I'm like, what? And I realized you can just feel these really complex rhythms it's better than trying to mathematically figure them out. So, it's really crazy, but the first few times I went and played with that band, I thought, I don't know if I can do that. I was just like, I don't know if I'm gonna stick with this. And I don't know, something, I love the music. The, the, the melodies are crazy. You know, the woodwind players were in there, this amazing guida player playing a bagpipe, but like crazy, like Jimi Hendrix on a goat skin bagpipe. And it was just, it, with an electric guitar and full drum kit, just like, you know, something kept me going. And thankfully I did. And um, the, the year right after I graduated, um, we played a huge um, folk music festival on the Black Sea. We were invited, so a group of us, with um, a group of Bulgarian, a Bulgarian women's choir, went and toured that country. So we went from the west all the way to the Black Sea and back playing, and it was amazing. And actually, Mark, I needed, of course, an assistant to help with the bass amplifier. <laughs> um, actually, Mark got I, hired on. I actually, I, I actually went as the videographer. It so was fantastic. I, so I was carrying the camera while she was carrying the bass. So I was capturing their mm -hmm. movements around the towns and around the cities and their performances. And 
capturing little intimate things at, at, the, at the places where we were staying mm -hmm. and bus rides and things of that nature. That helped my bass playing a lot and it really gave me a whole nother level of understanding of music because that really got me into playing from being in the closet and thinking I'm only going to be a singer in my life. Now I'm playing bass on tour in front of sometimes thousands of people because the festival was really the largest show I ever did live and it was kind of scary in a way <laughs> and good, a good, very good scare. And so what was it like just to play bass and not sing? I mean, because that was really probably the first time you'd, you'd had the opportunity mm. to do that. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, although I did a little bit at Long Beach City College in a jazz program there, so that's where it started, to know that it could be done. But I like it. Wow. I, I like it. Wow. And it's kind of hard to sing that stuff because it's in another language, but it's very beautiful. But I find there's so much going on with, with the with the rhythm, I kind of could sing the bass part. Well, I, I was listening to you rehearse earlier tonight, and I, I couldn't help but notice that in some of the songs, some of the rhythm p patterns are, are actually pretty tricky. Hmm. I mean, you guys do it like it's nothing, but, but, I mean, is that something that you're kind of like tapping into from your Bulgarian experience, or...? Is that just something that you guys have always done? I think for I think for me when I write stuff, I tend to to write in in odd meters. Sometimes it just feels like that's what it needs to be, and I, I do a lot of playing that way too. I mean, I my guitars are all tuned, all screwed up, and and, and I, I when I write songs or whenever we're we're trying to work out something, I'm really writing by ear and. And I'm pulling rabbits out of the hat at shows with solos and things. I mean, it's really a, a, a more of an expression than it is a, a technical putting together thing. And a lot of the times, I don't even know the chords. I'm, I'm actually playing on guitar in some of our songs. I know basically what the key is, and I, I know what I can get away with and, for soloing and stuff. But for the most part, yeah, I really... It, it's sort of a just a kind of an expressional instrument thing mm -hmm. for me. It, I, I I guess it's the Irish in me. I'm always I was fascinated with bagpipes, and I know they have the droning notes, and I I really I really gravitate towards the droning notes and and kind of open full kind of sounding chords. But then again, I like I like notes too. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. then. We have to talk about this show on Thursday. Um, I would love to talk about the show on Thursday. <laughs> it's probably one of the, this. The show on Thursday is probably one of the most exciting shows that we've done in a while. Uh, it's we've always wanted to play fingerprints, and wow, this is great. We're doing it. Well, so the show is surrounding the idea of this is Jim Morrison's seventieth birthday, if he were still alive. And so the the, the show is is a is. Of photo photographic images that Jim Coke took back in the early 60s, right before the Doors went to number one with, I believe it was Light, Light My Fire. Mm -hmm. Right, right before they did, right, right before they went to number one, they were doing a college gig. And it was 67, he said. And it was 67, and he was snapping pictures. And I think, I think the story goes, he snapped up all these pictures. He, he, he stored him in his parents' house. He, they were there for years. All of a sudden, he, um, he, he, he brought him out and he was looking at him and go, hey, these are great. I want to do something with these. So long story short, here he is today. He's got a mural on the, on the wall across the street from Fingerprints. And he's also showing prints inside Fingerprints. And we're sort of doing the opening show for him along with two other bands. We are accompanying Michael C. Ford and Michael C. Ford used to hang out with Jim Morrison and the guys from The Doors, and he would actually do shows with them and, and hang around and just hobnob with the, with, with the guys. And he still does, actually, with the surviving members. Mm -hmm. He's played with all of them individually. Mm -hmm. And he also did his first public poetry reading the same night Jim Morrison did his first public poetry reading, somewhere in 67 also, is as the story goes. Gosh, I wish I could remember the name of the place. Something called the word celluloid in it. Mm -hmm. Back and they they both read together publicly. Um, 
Michael C. Ford has also performed, you know, really lately with, with Ray Manzarek until almost, you know, the same year he passed away. Um, and the other members of the Doors, he's done tracking sessions, just anyway, with, with them. He still performs a lot. He's really intense. And actually, this will be the second time we are doing a show with him. Because back when Slushbox, in our early days, he saw us perform as a duo, kind of that an interim time between when we were threesome and Slushbox. Mark and I were performing, he was playing guitar, and I was playing this percussion rack that I made with a brake drum, remember a disc drum, mm -hmm. I used to hit it out with a mm -hmm. stick. I had this miscellaneous chalice, like from Goodwill or probably from Out of the Closet. And the most fascinating thing was <laughs> we took an old record player <laughs> yes. and we and we found LPs through friends that just had beats on them. And we would we would actually set down the needle <laughs> and we would actually time our songs together to match the length of time that this percussion thing was going on on vinyl. Even songs like Pomegranate, One Sold Animal, they mm. all had their own rust. Um, we worked out the songs to match the album. So when we when we wanted to do a new song on a performance, we well, wait a second, we have to change our LP album. So we change the LP and find and we say, ready, go. I had it down on pretty good science. So we you did. Were like, we had stuff we going did. on in between. Mark even played kazoo sometimes yeah. on one of those songs. But it was really cool because they were DJ records, but we weren't scratching with them. And we were not like really manipulating it. We just kind of, okay. Let it rip, and if there's an earthquake, it's going jolt, to jolt a little bit, but that's okay, we'll deal with it. So Michael C. Ford saw us do this, mm -hmm. and he wanted us to back him up. He had some later date when he did a show there. So we actually did a whole set with him. Which Where was, was that? At Viento y Agua. Nice. The hub, yes. It's nice. Because I think Jim did a show, Jim Coke did a photo show there mm -hmm. about six years ago. Maybe that's when that was. <laughs> so then you have two other bands on the on the lineup as well. Uh, two, two, two great other bands, Natural Hi-Fi and Move, both from Long Beach. Wow, that's great. Yeah, Move has been very kind of blowing up a little bit around town. Uh, They're doing some stuff, aren't they? Yeah. Move's, Move's doing some stuff. <laughs> They're on the move. They're always playing up at First Fridays in Bixby Knowles. They, they did uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Right, that's amazing. They, yes. They've done all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> in the last few months. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're... yeah, John Zell and the whole gang and scoring movies live and stuff. They've done so much. Right. Yes. And Natural High Fives is another uh, couple, Paul and Kim. And uh, Paul, for those who don't, who've never seen Natural High Five, he plays with one arm. He's a one arm guitar player. He plays only with his, he does not have a left arm to make chords, so he straps the guitar around him and he does everything with this. So he plays with hammer-ons. He, he, you know what? Like tapping. He, you know what? All He's of that. Technique, he, he, man. He, if I, it's amazing to watch this guy play guitar because he can do chords with one finger, he strums with his pinky, and, and, he, and, he, and he does solos around by doing hammer-ons and sliding up and actually pulling off strings and all this weird mechanical strange stuff that I've never it's seen amazing. in guitar playing. And it looks so smooth. But doesn't and that kind of piss, piss you off just a little bit? You know, <laughs> it really does piss me off and I've told him about this before. And, and he can sing like Jim Morrison days. too. He really can. He's got that like yell, that yelp that he can let out sometimes. Wow. Well that sounds like a bad fact. <laughs> so, so you're going to do a set, mm -hmm. then the other two bands are going to play. And then at the end, you guys are coming back for a set with poetry. Is that the well? Well, what's going to happen is we're going to we're going to open up the show, and Michael C. Ford is going to be there with us at some point on on the stage. And I'm hoping we get one of our own songs into along with Michael. Mm -hmm. And then the other two bands are going to play, and then we're going to do uh, again with Michael C. Ford at the end of the show to close out the show. I see. So I know you you guys have your own set list, you, your own songs that you play tight and cold, you, you know it backwards or forwards, but have you had a chance to work with Michael? Um, or is this going to be just like improv? Both. It's a little There's bit of both. both. It's a little <laughs> bit of both. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of improv and a little bit of calculating, but... Uh, we know from experience that time we did work with him six years ago, 
we know what what we want to do and what, what the job entails as we collaborate and um, there's certain things that we've, uh, we've negotiated like certain grooves for certain pieces that he has mm -hmm. and there's one that's definitely you know ambient whatever we want to do and whatever he wants to do so it's going to be you know but, but we don't really rehearse that you know we'll do it on the spot Excellent. <laughs> Excellent.